Ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed with the first session for the day. The speakers for this session are Professor Saroj Kuruvila, Andrew J. Nathanson, Family Professor of Industrial Relations, Asian Studies and Public Affairs, Cornell University, United States. Ms. Betty Lau, Global Learning Director of Leadership and Business Skills, Unidabra, Singapore. And Ms. Linda Downs, Chief Human Resources Officer, Mandri Pharma. The session will be chaired by Dr. Ithikar Ahmed Choudhury, Principal Research Fellow of ISAS and former Foreign Minister of Bangladesh. I now hand over to Dr. Choudhury. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on seamlessly to the next uh, session. Uh, within that, uh, the 15 minutes for each speaker, I should think. 15, 20 minutes. Uh, as you can see, I'm only here for, uh, because of my commitment to the uh, I'm, I'm basically a diplomat. Uh, uh, with some specialization, if you could call it that, in arms control and disarmament. So this is very, very different from what I normally do. But I have spent uh, a couple of years in the government in the sense that I was a member of the cabinet, as you've heard, and uh, my exposure to uh, broadly in the area of policy and also uh, 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 employment, global employment, uh, uh, skill development, etc., uh, leads back to that period. Uh, during which I was, yes, yes. by the way, as Martin mentioned in, this, uh, in, in, in the documents, I used to have a, a, a port traditional portfolio which was called uh, Expatriate Welfare and Overseas uh, Employment. Uh, uh, I, I, I've sat through some very stimulating talks yesterday and of course this morning, uh, but I, I thought maybe uh, it should be in order for me to say a few words about my own country, which is Bangladesh. Uh, because uh, it's a comparable milieu, and uh, many of the problems that I heard yesterday and today are also problems and solutions, of course, also applicable to uh, Bangladesh. Uh, yesterday, Dr. Krishnan was talking about uh, uh, the line ministries, apart from the Ministry of, 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 of Employment, you said Labour would be involved. Yes, we do believe that uh, in, in our system, at least four line ministries are involved in, in skill development. Uh, certainly the Ministry of, of Labour, the Ministry of Education, uh, 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 my own former ministry, which is Expatriate uh, uh, Welfare and Overseas Employment, and, and finally, finally the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, you see, uh, we have a national uh, skill development policy, I mean, which is called uh, NSDP, and, and the whole idea is to, to, uh, to coordinate uh, uh, all government and, and, and uh, so social activities to, uh, towards the goal of development of skill, knowledge, and innovation. Uh, philosophically, uh, the government's uh, policy is, uh, is, is something like what we call walking on two legs. On the one hand, uh, of course, it's, it's market-driven. On the other hand, government has a certain responsibility to take care of the citizens. And that's, that's the other day. So, uh, it, 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 this is an area in which uh, the, uh, uh, this is why, uh, this was the point I was making yesterday about the complementarity of the civil society in public activities where government and civil society have to work together. Government line ministries work together to set up what we call 15 ISCs, which is the uh, industry skill uh, councils that spread all over the country and who have also set up about 100 technical centers, generally for skill development. In my own ministry, I was set up 38 to train people for blue-collar jobs, jobs abroad. Now, the overall impact on poverty reduction uh, uh, has been very great. Bangladesh has done very well in, in terms of some of the social indices that uh, in some of the neighboring countries. Uh, during uh, our, our period of office, we reduced uh, poverty on the World Bank uh, numbers from 64 million to 47 million and met the, the, uh, the UN targets. Now, uh, you see, uh, as I said, uh, the, the civil society works very closely with the public sector with regard to this because there is one common, what I called aspiration yesterday, which is gender mainstreaming and that is very much a part of, of uh, policy making in Bangladesh. Uh, by almost by law, because uh, 
uh, there are many parliamentary statutes, etc., related to compulsory uh, mainstreaming of gender in HR policies, etc. Now, uh, the, uh, uh, this morning we talked about universities and definition of universities, etc. The civil society in Bangladesh, but could is here by 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 non-formal education, not in form, but non-formal education, just collapsing all of the things that the academic uh, 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 to, uh, to five, five years, uh, five years, and in which there is an element about, uh, devoted to skill development as well. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, a huge uh, majority of the students of these non-formal uh, uh, education process are doing. Uh, as you know, uh, garment industry is our major economic area of uh, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, industry. And uh, over 90% of, of the garment workers, the workers are, are, are women. Now, this has a tremendous uh, uh, positive impact in, again, uh, mainstreaming gender. Now, after they graduate, okay, I've heard that engineers are not necessarily employable, but what happens is that when you graduate from this uh, non-formal education uh, system, you are immediately, uh, uh, in, uh, you have uh, uh, access to what we call micro-credit. Micro and micro-credit enables uh, the, uh, the very uh, sort of entrepreneurial employment of all these uh, non-formal edu education graduates. Uh, uh, some of these are also fairly, fairly technical or, or, or uh, uh, part of the, what we call the digitalization of Bangladesh process. All of you, or many of you may have heard of this famous telephone ladies of Bangladesh. I mean, there are, uh, in every village, and we have about 16,000 of them, there are many micro companies formed by three or four women who get around the telephone uh, hire a telephone with the credit they receive and then uh, uh, lease this telephone for telephonic calls for the money thereafter. A third thrust, policy thrust, is to involve what we call the religious component of, of the education system into, into these activities. As you know, we have a, a large, very large number of madrasas. Madrasas are devoted to spiritual uh, education, of course, but uh, uh, because of uh, uh, realistic reasons, uh, there, there is an intellectual acceptance of the need to complement spiritualism with material uh, uh, needs, and, and part of the program uh, curriculum is changed to make it competency-based, uh, even the madrasa curriculum, curriculum, which is a very great, great help. Uh, sometimes uh, for, for these blue-collar deployment abroad, as I've said, uh, we have to negotiate with, with foreign governments, and that is how the MFA, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, gets involved. Uh, this is something that I think that I and I have once discussed. It. As you, many of you, or all of you perhaps, have been to London, and you know that 90, 95% of what is known as uh, Indian response in London are Bangladeshi owned, and they are owned uh, by uh, people from my own hometown, my own constituency, which is Silet. Uh, I had to negotiate with the British uh, uh, employment of 12,000 sous chefs every year, every year for, uh, for these. Uh, during a period of time, the labor government had really cracked back down on, on, on visas uh, for uh, provide sous chefs for all these, all these restaurants. Within two years, we sent out 1.8 million uh, contractual labor to many, many, many countries. So these are some of the stuff that we did in Bangladesh, but of course, uh, uh, this is just to complement what, what is on the agenda of the discussions. Uh, we have three uh, excellent speakers for, for this session. Uh, we have their uh, series, uh, uh, I will assume, um, so I shan't go into them. We have Professor Sarosh uh, Kuruvela, we have uh, Ms. Betty Lau, and we have, uh, we have Linda Downs. We will uh, begin with, uh, I'll begin by giving the floor to uh, Professor Sarosh uh, Kuruvela, uh, the Andrew uh, Nathanson Family Professor of Industrial Relations, Asian Studies, Public Affairs, Canal University, United States. Professor, the floor. Thank you. 15, 10 minutes. Uh, I, um, I have no particular uh, qualifications for being here. Uh, 
the only uh, I, I, I'm a scholar of labor and labor relations and labor and global supply chains. Uh, but uh, my uh, past misfortune, I was once uh, in Singapore and in a casual conversation, uh, I found out about Singapore's skills development system and I, first, I wrote an academic evaluation of that system. And you know, I mean, uh, academic papers published in scholarly journals are only read by other academics, and the vendor happened to read it. So that's why I'm here. Okay? <laughs> um, uh, so this is a very, you know, this is not a central area of research. But he did want me to talk about, you know, what have we learned from studying skills development in other countries, uh, and you know, what are some lessons. So that's uh, what I intend to, to do. Uh, so, uh, there's a recent article that uh, summarizes skills development in Asia and they sort of uh, talk about the three categories of countries, they classify countries into three categories where Singapore, Korea and Japan uh, skills development efforts work well and deliver some of what is intended in Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, Sri Lanka and Indonesia and extremely patchy which is India, China, Pakistan, Bangladesh and you know they have the standard criticism of uh, skills development efforts in South Asia, particularly India. And you know we've heard about all this before, so I'm not going to do anything. Okay. The first caveat uh, I want to make is that you know it's easy by like, looking through the literature. I spent a lot of time doing this. Uh, you can find descriptions of skills development systems in Asia. There are lots of descriptions. Here's how the system is, what they do, uh, but very, very little analytical assessments of how they work and, and why they work, what, what where's the data. And I'm I, I, uh, uh, kind of puzzled by this because this is a huge area. You expect uh, academics and uh, consulting companies or everybody else to be analyzing this really important issue. So maybe uh, the reason why not enough people are doing it is because uh, skills development systems are generally pretty complex and involve, uh, I guess, somebody doesn't want me to say this. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe they are complex and, and, and uh, they involve multiple components across different institutional arrangements, so it's hard to study. Uh, there's good quality data, it's hard to come by, <coughs> uh, at, at, at least over different levels. So you can get, for example, uh, data from the Institute of Technical Education in Singapore that will tell you the number of people who place, but then that's only one component in a larger, but Singapore is pretty good about keeping all this data up on the web, but very, very few countries are as transparent as that with their data. Um, the other problem is that um, assessments of how skills development efforts work um, requires extensive field research. There's no substitute in going up and talking to hundreds of people and figuring out how it works. And the economists who have studied skills development tend to use the data that is out there, but it's not the standard thing in economics to go out and do field really studies of how it's getting more popular. The fourth uh, problem as to, as to why I think um, there's not enough work here is that um, you know, it hasn't attracted enough funding, research is need to be funded. And then the fifth issue is that evaluation is not built into the policy initiative. So you know, many governments are saying, oh, we want to have a policy initiative on skills, but they don't build in an evaluation component and the budget and the process and mechanism. The second caveat is that everything I'm going to sort of say has been said in one way or another in some form already in this conference. So I am not adding value uh, in you know, an individual component. Maybe I might add value in terms of the overall lessons that we learned. So, uh, so the key, one of the lessons, I mean, one of the important things is that you're moving from low skills equilibrium to high skills equilibrium. Yeah, obviously it requires changes in supplier skills, but there are lots of other things that link the incentives to individuals, firms, skills development. Uh, and you know, the team's presentation this morning talked about 
you know, how there is alignment that is, there is an increase in alignment between individual centers to learn and you know, firms that will want them and teams are being uh, the broker or managed broker here in some sense. Uh, so, but in, in, in our system, the, the key issue is, you know, coordination has been particularly important. Uh, successful systems are better coordinated than less successful systems. So, basically, uh, uh, <clears throat> so if you look at the East Asian miracle, you know, the miracle, economic miracle was also accompanied by education miracle. And they happen at the same time. Uh, all of you have been in Singapore to know this. So Alice Amsden is a lot of her in Korea, uh, a link between the two. Uh, Malaysia is 2020 vision, you know, 1990, I was working in the Malaysian government. They thought that the, our vision is 2020, we want to be an industrialized country. And so I did the calculations. How many nurses by 2020? How many doctors? How many engineers must you produce in order to do that? And you know, that group that was doing these calculations ultimately did it. They did it through very innovative ways. They upgraded all these polytechnics to become two-year colleges and training arrangements for the screening members. Because they knew that they couldn't gear up the university system fast enough to do this. So um, um, so there's that link. And so the key question is about how the power they coordinate it. Uh, and, and you see, if you start the Singaporeans and the world will know that there's, you know, there are coordination mechanisms that <laughs> the professional education in Singapore is a key coordination mechanism between the Economic Development Board, the Ministry of Education, uh, and the whole series of other organizations. In Taiwan, we have a Council for Economic Planning and Development that they perform this coordination. In Korea, all of which came together in one organization. Uh, so this, uh, what makes for successful coordination? There's a lot of literature about this, but at least if you look at the process elements, in Singapore is like, for example, the job rotation by ministers, people in ministerial positions. That was Inga uh, Shai and Kala is talking a lot about Singapore's efficient democracy. But part of that is that this is job rotation. So you have the Secretary of the uh, Minister of Defense and the General of the Army, suddenly is the Chairman of the Labor Union Commission, and then so thereafter goes on to sort of be the Health Minister. You know. And so there's, there's that, there's that yeah. commonality, right? <laughs> uh, uh, so that creates that unified vision. And then when people at the top do it, people at the bottom also do it. You know, you know, uh, so, uh, so, uh, and each country will have a different set. I mean, Dr. Krishnan yesterday talked about how he co opted with somebody from another ministry to work with him. Did you say that? <coughs> right. And now that's maybe their method of creating these standards. So, but the key issue is the mechanisms of coordination. It may be informal in some countries, it may be formal. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, uh, one of the I was studying in Singapore had three secretaries of three different ministries and uh, their mechanism was coffee every Friday. So the ministers used to go off and meet at the golf club every Friday and these three secretaries used to meet for coffee every day. And that coffee was an informal coordination mechanism between the three ministries. It still happens in India. Okay. So, um, so the coordination mechanism is a key problem to figure out when each country will figure it out in, in some way. Um, the other thing is the sustained national um, effort. Uh, you know, in Singapore, it's, at least it's been able, people have been able to, there's a Singapore narrative, which we all know, and everybody's grown up with, they are a small country, you can describe in this large world, uh, you know, uh, with uh, we said competition, uh, and so on and so forth. And so that gives everybody that unity of purpose. You know, most Singaporeans tend to sort of understand the narrative almost going uh, on. So, so that's, that, that's unique in Singapore. But the Koreans, you know, have their own way of creating these narratives that, that, that people will come and understand. But India is, maybe we have our own narratives too, but it's, it's far more complex country, you know, in terms of international narrative. But these are all things that help the coordination.
Another interesting uh, uh, lesson is linking foreign direct investment or even local investment. I don't want to make a foreign thing important. Technology transfer and skills development. And here again, you know, uh, the Singapore example is particularly interesting, although this is already happening in other countries. So I don't want to say that. But when Singapore first started, they invited this German company called Rolle that made cameras. And they said, <coughs> come here, we'll give you 10 years. Uh, no competition in the market for the cam cameras. You can send the cameras. Ten years, no, no competition. We will provide buildings, we will provide land, we will provide the instructors, and we will provide the machinery to train us. And of course, because we are doing this, we get first dibs on the graduates. So we will guarantee you a supply of good graduates, trained by yourself, you know, and then after ten years, uh, you know, I mean, it's and you continue doing this, and after a while, the, the directors of those vocational training institutes, the Rogue Institute, took over the syllabus and then disseminated it over other vocational institutes. But then they built it further from one company, Rogue, to the German Singapore Institute of Technology, which then attracted all kinds of German companies, or, you know, on and off, and then the Japan Singapore Institute of Software Tech, which then attracted Japanese companies, the same model. They provide the instruction, Singapore provides lands and buildings, and you know, then that, that syllabus is disseminated throughout. So, um, so I, again, we think the beginnings of efforts by like Islamra and other places, and this is not a new, this is a well known issue, but I think it's it's a lesson, you know, about how how, how well it is. Uh, then there's a question of the firm level, you know, what is it that we can do at the level? So taxes, uh, you know, ta taxes are one way in which you can induce firms to change behavior and stuff like that. There's much that we've written about this in the post skills development fund, the Malaysian skills development fund, all of which tax the employer, X percent of payroll taxes paid to the government, you only can recoup it if you can engage in training. Of course, when it was first introduced uh, way back in the 80s, it was uh, firms used to send their chief executives to Harvard for the business course and that's the way they would be trained. But then, you know, the government got smarter and said, you know, you have to train 60% of your workforce in order to sort of get your money back. Korea has also used the little taxation system to, you know, to, uh, to, to, to get companies to pay. That's one way. The other way is the subsidies to firms or apprenticeship program. We talked about this, uh, uh, the government of India is doing this. Uh, but Australia and New Zealand, so we have all of them being subsidies. The third is, you know, collaboration in a competitive environment. Uh, and how do you get firms who are competing with each other to collaborate with them? And this seems like a natural. So, you know, when, uh, when India was going through this big boom on call centers and software, Turnover rates were, you know, 17 percent, 25 percent, and some call centers turnover rates were 50 percent. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Call centers are often those are jobs, those are design jobs. But still, but the people are complaining about the shortage. And we held a meeting in in NASCOM. With the help of NASCOM, we held a meeting in India of all the major players and said, look, you can solve this problem easily because you can all get together and contribute money to start a training institute. All of you can sort of get their graduates, use the training, we get the graduates, that will satisfy your demand and the quality that you want, uh, rather than sort of depending on hundreds of labor market intermediaries who are then providing training. So the question wasn't successful uh, because firms had a problem with competing when they collaborate. You know, and and it's, it's a mindset issue. We tried several two meetings, but we just wasn't uh, uh, successful. But we need to think of ways in which we can incentivize them. So the costs of what they spend on internal training, which is external training, is equal to the market. Uh, so, so the whole idea of collaboration and the building environment is really important for students. Okay. Moving along, uh, you know, again, uh, the vocational education. Linkages. I don't want to talk about this. Several examples of yesterday. All of yesterday was on that issue. So it's not talked about. But you know, I do want to talk a little bit about internships and the dangers of internships.
internships which has been kind of the paper written by somebody about internships from Chinese vocational education institute in China providing internships to uh, Foxconn. Right? And uh, the, the interns who are paying money for this vocational education effort, uh, they might be interested in aeronautical engineering, just all kinds of technical skills, but the Foxconn is told the vocational education institute we need you know, so many people working on our production line. And 15 percent of Foxconn's workforce in that particular region of China came from this, this vocational education institute. And the professors, the teachers of that institute also moved to Foxconn in order to supervise their employees, supervise their students while they were working in Foxconn as assembly line workers. So there are those kinds of negative issues that we can use to work I think there's, there's, we're missing out on talking about other training skill providers like labor unions and craft grade guilds. They, they exist in the US at least. The only way you can become a certified plumber or an electrician is to become to undergo, undergo labor union training. But the unions are the ones who provide the training and the apprenticeship. Uh, the only way you can become a cinematographer in Hollywood is through cinematographers guilds, you have to sort of join the guild and join that group in order to serve. So I think we need to look at those um, uh, I think the literature is very heavily focused on the firm, but I'm sort of saying what the hell is a firm these days, because most firms have dismantled their internal labor markets and have externalized them. They want shovel ready people from outside rather than train people from within. So this is where Organizations like Team Lease and other services come in because they are often the only source of information matching supply and demand. So in the US, for example, there's a small, uh, quite a big company called Kelly's Temp Services. They provide, they do exactly what Team Lease started out as. <coughs> the only source of data in the American labor market about you know, what are the skills and shops that supply and where is the demand comes from, studies of firms like this. But we, in India and other places, we don't sort of take cognizance of these firms who are labor market intermediaries and sort of to bring them also into the same policy discussion that, that regular firms and industry and industry representatives. So I think we have to sort of change the definition of the you know, uh, that is. Okay. The third thing is the individual level. So national level, we talk about coordination, so that again, a lot of these points have been made. Uh, so career guidance for high school um, students is quite crucial. It's a crucial element. Uh, I think uh, the, the Western Europe does a very, very good job of these people doing a very, very good job. But this is something that's quite absent in a lot of places because students are not quite getting the advice. Uh, school university linkage is uh, this is something that. Uh, at least in the US, we are starting where uh, universities tend to adopt you know, in local schools in inner city districts like in Chicago, University of Chicago is adopting one of the poorest schools. So there are potential ways of connecting with universities. Uh, mobilizing the community around skills and careers, you know, we talked a lot about decentralization in India at the Manchayat level. Uh, again, we have a way of sort of bridging, building skills with those mojaic level institutions. Uh, Corporate sponsorship. Now, India is unique because it has a CSR law that a lot of requires companies to set aside X percentage of their income, larger companies, for skills development. No, for CSR, corporate security. Uh, Many, many companies and I met many of them have said that we don't know where to spend this money, we don't know what to do with it. So maybe there's a potential connection of these and the skills in which is continuing up slowly. Now, what about indigenous skill formation system? Let's go back to plumbers, the Oriya plumber, you know, so there's a very interesting thing in India where traditionally the plumbing in all the big cities, the plumbers came from this one block. 
or the Kendra Prada block in Patanande district in Orissa, one area supplies 70% of the plumbing work in all the major towns. This is a craft scale, there's a long history of why that particular district in the world. 70% of the national users. 70% of the northern users. Right? Major measures of plumbing. And so they, they are, uh, this is what we call ethnic or cultural closure. There is a group who specialized in this area, they've done it historically. Everybody is like, <laughs> uh, um, Manish talked about an Oriya plumber. So this has become a part of the Indian folklore, you know, the Oriya plumber. Now at the same time, these guys have been working um, for years and years, but in the 90s after liberalization, we had professional plumbers who worked in the Middle East come back. They realized that India was going to be on a boom, so they started the Indian Plumbing Association. Um, which then they had to sort of systematize, you know, occupational licensing, they want to reserve. These two organizations are not working in parallel. They're not working together, they're working in competition. As a result, this entire bit of knowledge that is there with the Indian plumber is beginning to be less relevant and dying out because now you have a certificate, you have an occupational license, you have um, Program, losing out on that key element of knowledge that they have. And so India is full of these indigenous knowledge specializations like the Katyavadis and cutting and polishing diamonds. You know, there's no formal, you don't go through a formal process of training. It's all done within the and so on. And so I think in the informal sector in India, one needs to sort of think about how do you make use of this indigenous knowledge and build it. Your organization is particularly could be used for that because you have connections with uh, Then the informal sector, you know, this is also well known about the organizations like SEVA, which trains women. I don't know the extent to which they connect with the national skills, maybe they are, maybe not. Uh, if they are, they should be. The fourth is um, information regarding <coughs> One of the key issues is, you know, how do people know where is the labor market information? Uh, and so, uh, and how do people get connected to labor market information? So, uh, the classic example was in this World Bank study where they trying to sort of figure out um, what kind of unemployment insurance system is best. They said, we will study this by looking at how quickly people move in and out of employment. And the Swedish system was the best in the sense that you lost your job and you found another job really quickly. But the key element about why that was working is how institutions work actually had its roots in a particular law that required every company when they put out an ad to send a copy of that ad to the to, to the labor ministry on a website and then the labor ministry then used that to correlate what skills were in demand. So then when you lost your job and you went to pick up an unemployment insurance, you know, local unemployment insurance, they would say, okay, fine. What are your qualifications? They would say, I'm a skilled baker. I work in a good baking company. Well, there are no jobs in Stockholm, but there are jobs in Gothenburg. If you're willing to move, we will subsidize your move for a while. So that's one minute. But if there are no jobs at all for a skilled baker, then there is, here's a list of skills that are in job supply, and here's a list of training institutions where you can Go. So the Swedes have that method of labor market information. We don't have, I mean, the US doesn't either, so you know. So we need to think about how, how we create this at the state level. And I think all of these are state level things, they don't think central. So, so that uh, connection to labor market, you know, our linkages between unemployment insurance, skill shortages, and education level. Industry councils are noted in India's plan, so I think that that's a way that some of this information is written. But how do they work? Um, uh, key issue is um, how best to maintain the relevance of this development. Maybe in India's it's industry councils, they're supposed to make sure that the educational training institutions are producing relevant skills. Uh, is that in, in Singapore, it worked in a numerous different ways, but including the fact that every board was tripartite in nature. So you had industrial representatives, labor representatives, as well as government That created a way of keeping it relevant. Uh, so how best to maintain the relevance is a key. Okay, 
so so we're already making connections that are way beyond traditional skills development education, immensely education, uh, in the market. <coughs> the final thing uh, is you know really high level skills because I think uh, just as India has a problem with low level skills and you know, education at the bottom level, I think we also have to high skills. And so uh, thinking about high skills ecosystems, you know, how how do you create and sustain and self-sustaining high skills? So they require high skill ecosystem like Silicon Valley requires a kick you know, or Singapore, you know, which is at one point in the nineties wanted to become like Silicon Valley. They said a big kick is government funding. Singapore government is pretty big. Whereas the kick is in, in other places, I think Silicon Valley are quite different. Uh, the nourishment which is uh, supported and you know every kids need nourishment is here we need intellectual nourishment as well as financial capital. And again, you know, on, on the Indian side, uh, India has great higher education institutions. They don't necessarily quite do the kind of research that is required to drive innovation and change. Uh, so the, those aspects are key. Supportive environment, uh, yes, uh, you know, good schools and good roads and all of that are key. Singapore has them, uh, you know, India needs them. Uh, but there's also other issues like, uh, you know, especially when you think of development and entrepreneurship, uh, there are other issues like bankruptcy laws. The reason why Singapore couldn't have become a Silicon Valley is that the price of failure in Singapore is so high. You fail once and there are no bank will look at you. And society, of course, also has a problem with, you know, if it doesn't do well. So uh, that's also part of the support of the environment. And the Kiasu. The Kiasu is there. And then there's, you know, interdependence and networks, which uh, my is already talked about, because people often learn in networks. And so uh, California, Silicon Valley, all of the programmers, many programmers work independently in gig, on the gig economy, but they keep their skills updated through networks. And so we need to sort of see what these networks are. And a lot of times we'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Professor, uh, the next 15 minutes will go to uh, uh, Ms. Betty Lau. She is the Global Learning Director, Leadership and Business Skills of Unilever. And she will, uh, her, her topic is igniting the passion of lifelong learning. When we look at the uh, business environment now, actually we are entering into a state of uh, multipolar world. 
we, we see a lot of uh, divergent view. We see a lot of um, uh, unexpected event that happens in different parts of the world that will disrupt the business system. People are living very differently with, uh, with digital knowledge and also technology revolution. And also the environment is under stress. Um, we experience a lot of um, shortage of water, um, which actually um, under, uh, undermine our product uh, development and also the uh, technology that we have been using to produce the product have to be changed. So um, because of all the above reasons, we have to change the way that we develop our leaders. We have to develop leaders equipped to deliver value and value. It's not only about the, uh, the money, the value to our shareholders, but also what are the core values that we would like to achieve as a company. Um, we stop giving labels to our leaders uh, starting from last year. So we don't label them as high potential, but what we're trying to do now is uh, trying to develop leaders at all levels to make sure that they have sustainable growth and to ensure that their employability is there. So the new journey for our learners is we used to have very label-based kind of uh, curriculum. If you are high potential, you go to high potential program. If you are senior leaders, you go to senior le leaders program. We just train you based on your label, but not based on who you are as a human being. And now we're moving to a persona-based design, so we will be focusing more on your individual capability in order to train you. In the past, we have a static curriculum, we have a very flashy curriculum that we try to refresh every year. But now, we, because of the technology, we can have very dynamic learning interaction together with people all around the world simultaneously. And in the past, we're teaching quite generic kind of leadership model, we have a lot of classroom training, but nowadays we're trying to enable people um, to achieve agility through learning and through play. So um, our purpose is actually to be more human, more simple and create more impact. Um, we have our, so what I'm talking now is actually part of the experimentation that we're testing now. And I'm not sure if this is going to be successful or not, but the, um, the original point that we're looking at is looking at each individual as a unique entity and how are we going to help them to develop their potential to the fullest. That's our purpose. So um, we are a very strong purpose company. Uh, what we are trying to do this year is uh, to roll out the, um, the purpose initiative. So we're trying to help our employees to find out what is their life purpose and does it align to your work? If not, what are you going to change as a human being? Or you may, you may be some of them will change job, but the most important thing is help them to find out what is their life purpose. And the other thing that we're trying to look into is about the psychometric profile um, of each individual. The reason why this is important is we want to make sure that people are aware that we are working with a very diverse team. People are thinking very differently, they might have different beliefs, and that's why they do things quite differently. With the awareness of the diversity, we can start to create a very inclusive working environment. Rather than fighting, we start to have a dialogue, we start to have a conversation. And we try to look into each individual skills profile. For some of the function, they are much more vigorous, like um, engineering, uh, supply chain, they are very rigorous skill functions. But for some, uh, kind of functions that general manager, the skills profile we have, but, um, but it's quite different to articulate a GM in an emerging market versus a GM in a developed market. How, sim how similar or how different it can be. Um, so that's why we now work with a startup company to look into um, uh, kind of problem solving um, software. A problem solving uh, software that uh, we can ask them to answer questions so that we can deduce what kind of skill sets that they have. So, those skill sets are rather generic leadership and business acumen kind of skill sets like numeracy, um, like strategic thinking, like organizational design. So, with that kind of application, we can understand how well the person is in terms of doing execution. Because um, we always see that, of course, knowledge profile is easy to assess because uh, we can look at your CV, we can look at your result, we know what kind of knowledge you have. But how do you apply your knowledge in the workplace? Actually, it's quite difficult to detect until we see you at work. So that's why um, we also now started to uh, separate skills and also knowledge profile. For the knowledge profile, basically, we're trying to um, help you to understand what is your knowledge level is 
you have to do in a short survey, like five or six questions before you um, join each of the program. So that we can make sure that we can um, give you a personalized um, learning experience based on your own profile. And the third thing that we do is we try to infuse work and life through play and technology. And this early this year when we started the design thinking process, we interviewed about 100 um, of our employees from different functions and different countries. One thing in common is they said that our, the, the technology that we are using at work is much more um, le uh, remote than the one that they use at home. So we can see the big difference that because of security, because of other reasons, the, the work technology that we're using is actually not as advanced as what we're working at home. So with that thinking in mind, we were thinking about um, using some of the technology that is already happening in the world, in our daily life, and bring it to, um, to, to, to do learning. And the, the offering that we have is all about the employee. We have to help them to find out what's their purpose. We help them to understand better about themselves. We have to help them to understand what kind of skills we actually have in terms of execution. Uh, what kind of competency and knowledge that you possess. And finally, with all this kind of information, we open up the door for you to look at and play around with different um, uh, working identity. Because what we understand is um, the work that we have now might not be exist in uh, two to three years time. Even the way that we are doing learning is so different that when I look at my, my team skill profile, I think probably only two of them have the kind of skills that we need in order to deploy the new form of learning. So we want to make sure that our colleagues have this kind of understanding where my skill level is, how am I going to improve myself, what are the areas that is really my purpose, related to my purpose, and I really want to enjoy my work and life together. We try to help them to open up different possibilities. Either you can work in HR, or if you have a passion about other things, we can also open a discussion that you can actually use project work as a part of a skills development to enable you to open up other possibilities in work. And about infusing work and life through play and technology, we started um, uh, the pilot in uh, different factories in, uh, in different parts of the world. Um, in the beginning of this year, when we talked to some of the service providers, the quotation is really, really high. When we talk about virtual reality, the development cost is about £150,000 just for the development. And when we started to talk to um, a startup company, the cost can go down to $8,000 now. With the, with the easiest um, deployment technology by using a QR code, then we can actually enable virtual reality kind of training. The reason why we want to bring in virtual reality training in, uh, in factory first is first, we want to make sure that um, the blue collar have the experience of technology because we, we can see that actually the, um, the, uh, the change in, in, work, uh, in shop floor will be bigger, much bigger than uh, white collar space. So when we bring in technology, we open up the possibility and they see technology, they can work with technology and it makes their life easier so that we can actually ignite the passion of learning in them. They become more curious, they can actually see that we are not only you know, um, operator, we are actually using the latest technology in order to learn and I can also teach my kids through um, different kind of technology. And also, um, the middle one probably everyone will recognize, Pokemon. Pokemon is actually mixed reality technology. In the past, it's very expensive, but with Pokemon, it becomes so cheap now. So now we can actually use mixed reality technology to do leadership training. We can actually do uh, leadership coaching. We can do any kind of training based on this kind of technology. So the new leadership curriculum is we understand that people are always in transition. So rather than having a static kind of curriculum, we provide support on transition and onboarding. When you are moving to, when you are a new joiner, when you have horizontal move or expanded responsibility, a lot of time if you are moving within the company, people forget to onboard you again. They thought, that, oh, it's the same company, it's the same business. But actually it was very different in different parts of the world. And even if you are working in the same function, if you are moving to um, a different category, 
the, the onboarding is very necessary because the business environment is totally different. The other thing we still maintain is for the key roles, like general manager, female leaders, Asian leaders. We are trying to identify pockets of, um, of a senior position that we don't have enough representation of female, Asian, African leaders. So we provide um, uh, training for them and also the non-Asian, non-female together. The objective, again, is to um, uh, un let people understand diversity and create an in inclusive workplace um, in the future. And most important of all is uh, we see training as doing exercise. So that's why we create a leadership team. That you have to go back to the gym every day. Today you might want to do muscle training, or the other day you want to do a cardio training, or you want to have a trainer, which is like a coach or mentor, that help you to work on different parts of your muscle every day. So it becomes part of your life that you can actually learn every day to improve your skills all the time. Even though the business environment is very tough, but we see that this is actually the, uh, one of the best opportunities that we can get to uh, regenerate learning and make sure that the learning is more relevant to my colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, we are, we'll have the Q&A afterwards. Uh, we'll be about uh, 20, 25 minutes or whatever we have left after the speakers have spoken. Uh, next on my list will be uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Linda Downs, uh, she's the uh, Chief Human Resources Officer of Ubuntu Firma and uh, her subject will be a broader cross-market view of vocational training. Uh, Ms. Downs. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So, my official title is Chief Human Resources Officer of Ubuntu Firma. Obviously, we both scratched our heads a bit to wonder how, how I would bring value to this day and a half. And um, what I thought would best work is how I can share with you some of my experiences as an employer in the various roles and companies and industries that I've worked in around the world. And yesterday, what I found particularly fascinating about the topic that was discussed and shared by very experts in the field here was the commonalities that I see between the challenges that are unfolding in India and have been unfolding and the experiences that I have. And to be fair, not always have I dealt in vocational space in terms of technical training or certifications, but I really believe that learning and development covers off skills, knowledge, and abilities, and that will encompass every level of learning and development throughout our lifespan. So, I uh, ask you to join me in my adventures here. And I come from a, a fairly analytical background, so I always think about problems in terms of how do I simplify it such that I can fix it at the root cause? Because oftentimes what we see are symptoms of problems and not the problem itself. And I think you really have to take a minute to think through that, to understand what's really going on, so you can fix at the very base level which then generates the outcome that you're looking for. So I think a lot in terms of inputs and outcomes. And so what I've set up here is a project management outline, and these are through, believe it or not, I have probably 30 years of experience at this stage. I know, it astounds you to me. And this has been happened for me mostly outside of my country of origin. And I've worked in multiple industries in multiple markets in both developed and developing economies, and I will tell you the single thing that is in common in all of my experience is my experience with the people in those markets. I would say every person I have ever met with any level of education or non-education or experience, everybody wants to add value. We all feel need that feeling of, of having a purpose in life. And I think if you can touch people in that part of your being, that is where you make change happen. So let's walk through this. I know I'm on the clock here, so I'm going to get my warning at some point. I am very passionate, so I will speak at length, but I'll try to be quick. Okay, so first of all, I think success means everybody involved in the problem is going to take away something of value. If not everybody is winning, they won't be part of the solution. 
And so I put up an example here that happened to me very early in my career. I was in the high tech industry in Canada dealing with technical talent. These folks already had degrees, master's degrees, PhDs. They're working in industry. I was in a high tech firm. But like all of us, they aspire to more. The big question was, how do I add more value to the organization? I might be very, very, very good at my job, but the company actually values people who can manage other people and extract value from them. So what we did was we worked with a local university to create a certificate-based program. They earned university credits. They still worked on the jobs. The company as an employer, that's very important to me. I want these people to continue to add value. But they were able to take away some learning. What did the university get? They now had a certification program they could offer to other high-tech firms. My employees were better fit for purpose for my organization and even other employers as well. And they had a piece of paper that didn't just have my company name on it, they had something of value to them that they could carry with them throughout their careers. The second one is the funding model, and I think we, we heard a lot of conversation about this yesterday and even earlier this morning about who pays for this stuff. And all I would say to you is there's no free lunch. We all have to have some skin in the game. Again, if you give me something that is free, how do I value that compared to something that I've had to earn through my personal blood, sweat, and tears? Honestly, you don't value something that people give you. And again, I learned that through trial and error. But all I would say is that we have to make everybody pay a portion of this. If somebody doesn't have the money to pay for it up front, and I understand there's huge populations in India who probably don't have disposable income, let's pay for them up front. But I tell you what, if they are not successful in that thing we gave them, they need to pay that back. You have to make them feel accountable to earn their success, because if they get it for free, they're not going to value it. And we go back to the fundamental premise that people want to feel like they are worthy and that they are able to add value, right? All right, next one, delivery models. And um, my colleague from Unilever talked a lot about learning and development. And at the top, I think what you see in very small writing there is 70, 20, 10. What does that mean to me? It means as an employer, I will tell you what, I have very scarce resources in terms of time and money to spend on my employees. I want to extract maximum value for them. So as an employer, I'm incredibly selfish. And what that 70-20-10 means is that what I understand based on my own professional expertise and all of the learning models that you guys can go read many academic papers on this, as I have done, is that people learn best by doing. And as a company, we commit to our employees that they will be given the opportunity to learn and grow. But by and far, the bulk of that learning is coming from on the job. That's the 70%, okay? So 70% of your learning, and at the current employer that I'm at right now, we promise 40 hours a week, five days a year to every employee. But 70% of that is going to be on the job training. What does that mean? We're going to stretch you, we're going to challenge you, we'll put you on projects. You'll have opportunities to contribute outside of the day job that we hired you for. 20% is through mentoring and coaching. We'll give you access to other people who know what they're doing. This could be similar to an apprenticeship program. And 10% is going to be classroom-based. Now, why is classroom-based? So little, because adults don't retain knowledge. You can't send someone away for two weeks and expect them to come back to the office and be able to apply those skill sets in a productive fashion. So again, employers are selfish. We want people who are productive as quickly as possible with the least amount of investment. And that is our motivation when we're looking at hiring. The example I put up here is this really interesting tool we launched about 18 months ago. It's a gamified learning application, and it's anytime, anywhere, on the go, wherever. And I was thinking yesterday when we talked, when we heard from, I think it was the keynote speaker, the basic premise is that you need a certain level of numeracy and literature to eat the literature, I'm sorry, um, reading comprehension in order to be even eligible to join even the most fundamental programs. You can set this tool up. It cost me $10,000 US to create, no, that's saved. So not that much. $10,000 to create a single module. It will take me possibly 
two to four weeks, depending how much time I, and energy I give it to create this. You can set that up. You can then distribute that across any number of markets in any language that you want in such a way that every person can do this little simple test. And what I love about this tool, tool is, one, it's gamified. I mean, we are appealing to younger generations who expect to have fun at work. <laughs> and I know what comes up. What this tool does and what you see here, and what I love the best about it is, as an employer, it gives me pre and post test. And this has been pushed through the regression analysis, and this is actually accurate, so I can tell how good someone is the day that they take the test for the first time, then they go through my learning program, and they get assessed on an ongoing basis. So we can tell how much they're learning and how much they're retaining. So this is a, such a very simple, simple way to get information into people's hands. It can be done incredibly quickly and for very short, small amounts of money. There's all sorts of info in here. You're going to have to come up to me later and ask if you want to know more. Um, maximizing the talent pool. You know, I should have said at the beginning, although I grew up in a recessionary period in Canada, and I had a Bachelor of Arts degree in English literature, you can tell me how easy it was to get a job. It wasn't. I had to leave the country to get one. Every single job I've ever held in my entire life where I've been tasked to find people is there's always been a shortage of people. I've never been in the luxurious position of having thousands and millions of people to select from, but I tell you what, again, as an employer, when you start to think about the talent pool, it shrinks quite significantly when you start at the top to say, there's a lot of people here, do they have the right skills, knowledge, and ability, and are they fit for purpose for my company? Typically, by the time you get through that pool, you end up with a very small pool of select people that you really, really, really want to hire, and then it is very, very hard. And so, in this particular example in China, I was working in um, Hong Kong uh, for a Chinese family business in manufacturing that we manufactured our products in um, Guangdong. We had a 30,000 person campus there. And one of the biggest struggles we had was that our turnover in our engineering staff was between 40 and 50 percent per annum. So you can imagine again, as an employer, what a challenge that is to attract people, train them so they fit the purpose for our company, and then see them leave in less than 24 months. So one of the big challenges was there was a huge disconnect between the Hong Kong population, also Chinese, and the mainland Chinese population, also Chinese. I'm Canadian, I'm like, we're all the same. Why why can't you get along? And of course, it's not that simple. Right? So you gotta ask the right questions of the people, what's going on here? Well, first and all, foremost, engineers, back to my original uh, example there when we talked about high tech, is that engineers also want to grow in their careers. What do you do with an engineer? You give them more engineering, but they want to progress in their career paths. Titles are important. Compensation is important. So what we decided was that we thought, hey, what if our technical talent could grow to the top of the organization in much the same way people leaders can? Could we give them then two opportunities? They can either continue to specialize in only being technical experts only, being technical experts and being valued for that at the same rate that we value the counterparts who manage other people. So we introduced something really simple called the dual career path, where you could progress and grow your career in a rather flat structuring, either by growing more technical skills or through managing other people. And at the same time, we had a big disconnect in how we titled people depending on their country of origin. So what we thought was just throw that out the window and why don't we just keep people job titles that are reflective of the roles that they're bringing and not value based on their country of origin. So these two things went a long, long way to decreasing our employee turnover, and we were able to keep people for longer, not as long as I would have liked, but much longer than the original premise, which was 18 to 24 months. Hiring and selection. This has to come into consideration when you think about skills training programs, because you know, people are people are people, and people want what people want, and you've got to appeal to the nature of the individual that you're connecting with. And I've said right up front there is you hire for attitude and train for skills. Why is that? You can't change people's fundamental core values. 
but you can add to their skill portfolio and make them more employable or employable in the first case. I gave you this professional service example. This was uh, one of my more interesting roles. I worked in Malaysia working for an environmental consulting company. I uh, had oversight of HR for all of Asia Pacific, and it was a British-owned firm, and you know the senior partners would come out to the region and they would scratch their heads and they would say, how come it's so hard to find partners in some of these markets? Uh, and I would say, well, I don't know, let me look into it and I'll get back to you. So off you go to the field and talk to a few folks in Indonesia, and I discovered, well, indeed, Indonesia, like every other market that we operated in, we had some great talent. You know why they weren't getting through the partner and training program? Because they have to present a business case, much like a thesis in the university, to the senior partnership panel, who would then vote on their competence and capability of joining the partnership pool. And of course, the partnership pool was aspirational because that was where you had equity and you had put your skin in the game. And so nobody could ever get past that gate. It was impossible, never in the history of the company, had we had a partner that had originated from a non English speaking country. Again, self-evident, but nobody had asked the question. And the other flip side of that is, if I'm based in Jakarta and all of my key cus customers are Indonesian, why do I need any language other than Bahasa Indonesian? I don't, right? I mean, you guys are nodding your heads, but this is almost laughable and stupidity, but these are people sitting in the UK running businesses that are operating in small markets, in developing markets, and laying out criteria that they themselves were familiar with in the days when they were hired or promoted. And it's really about transforming the status quo and changing the expectations and the definitions of success. All right, is centralized or decentralized? Oh my goodness, do we not argue about this one a lot, even in my current company, but I'll tell you what, it's a both-end model. Why is that? Because you have to have a common framework and a consistent goal. If you don't all know what success looks like, how can it be possible to deliver success? Now, the reality of that is when you execute the common goal of success, the flavor of that is going to change depending on where you implement it. If you go out into the provinces in India, I expect there's different languages, different cultures, different religious freedoms, different issues regarding women in the workforce. Those need to be dealt with, adapted, and fixed while maintaining line of sight on the goal or the outcome. And so what I look at is just the distributed model here is you start with the central premises that we need to skill our people more. And then you go out, 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 out. Yesterday we saw the video um, from one of the speakers of a woman in the field. He actually went right out there. And I would say to you the number one biggest contributor towards success is understanding the problems as they're faced in the place where you need to fix the problem. Okay, and I'll get to that at the very end. Um, the just do it analysis paralysis, we've got to get it perfect before we roll it out. No, that's not true. Get it out, get it happening, and then fix it as you go. The ecosystem will tell you whether it's working or not. If you don't have any partners from a language, from a country that doesn't have English as a native language, clearly you've got a problem. That's the problem that you fix. You don't throw more money into your training program. Communications and change management. This is a big one. Um, how do you engage the entirety of the, the stakeholder pool in, in the thinking around why the change needs to happen? And back when I started my career, actually when I went to grad school, I remember Cotter's uh, eight-step process to change management was, was in vogue in those days, and it was really about the burning platform and change you have to go through this series of eight things in order to make change happen. And typically, these projects took, what, three, five, ten years, and you never got to the end goal. The reality is today that you've got to change on the fly and understand exactly what's happening. We talked about in the bank, we hire um, customer service reps. Again, these are commodity jobs, much like manufacturing and other technical jobs. Individuals can go to any company and offer the same skill sets. There's no differentiation in the job skills. We were trying to create an intern program specific to our organization where we can attract and retain people and expand our talent pool. Again, going back to the fact there's always a short. Yeah. My other time, I think. Yeah. Yeah.
what we found was one of the reasons the program didn't actually work was because the people who were around the individuals who'd been selected on the program were not supporting it. They were resisting the change. Indeed, there was a level of animosity and jealousy around how come this person who's never worked for this company, who has no loyalty to the organization whatsoever, is getting a benefit that you won't offer to me. So if we're going to go to an external market and bring people in and give them special opportunities, we must consider the fact that we also need to offer special opportunities to our own staff. Right? Don't punish somebody because they're already with you. <laughs> At least give them a chance to apply and see if they're interested. All right, and my conclusion, so I'm almost on time. I say talk to the experts, and that's the people in the field. That's not those of us who are sitting in the office thinking about the problem. And if you don't have someone who goes to the field on your behalf who you trust to actually listen and ask good questions, then you need to get thyself out there. Because for me, success didn't come from what I knew. Success came from what people told me about what was important to them. And my job was about transforming the organization's delivery of solutions such that they appeal to the individual we were trying to connect with. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. For your broad, broader relevance across this broad spectrum of HR specific. I'm, going to, uh, I'm, I'm afraid we don't have too much time. We have time for three questions, so I allow for that. And you'll identify yourself and identify the speaker at which the question is addressed. Do so. Yes. Uh, so I have two related uh, questions that may be relevant to all the speakers. So, uh, I think Surf brought up a very important issue about internship with all these Chinese vocational schools who receive criticisms nowadays for selling interns to force them work in all these uh, uh, workshops. And I confirmed it with our Indian colleagues that uh, they say sometimes they receive similar criticisms. Uh, but on the other hand, we hear from employers' side that there's no free lunch from the US in training, so we have to have some guarantee that they come to our workplace eventually. And I don't know how the Indian government manage this, but search measure that they have the priority to select uh, trainees from their institutes. Um, I don't know if they prevent those trainees from a broader job search, but if you ask as I know people, uh, at, at legal terms, this is false labor if they can't go to other employers for potential job opportunities, right? Um, so my question one would be how do firms manage this so-called partner, uh, public-private partnership in terms of avoiding free rider issues? Uh, and my second question may be more relevant to uh, Ms. Lau. You know, in Unilever, you show us a very comprehensive internal training system. Um, so you know, when I talk to leading firms in China, they always told me, oh, we don't need to collaborate with vocational schools because we have already very comprehensive internal training system. And then I asked them, what would you then expect from graduates? They, they told me personal quality, what they call shuji in China. And then when I asked them to disaggregate what's personal quality, they talk about, a lot about being obedient, being professional, being keen to learn. You know, so we have a whole discussion yesterday about what's, what are the skills that firms need, right? Seems they focus a lot on attitudes as opposed to real skills. So I also would like to ask our employers, what kind of skills would you expect from our vocational school graduates? Thank you. Okay, uh, the second and the third question. Uh, Bajian. Anish, are you there? Okay. <laughs> You spoke of coordination problems uh, and, and, and uh, across the different stakeholders in the skills development uh, phase. Um, could you, given your extensive experience, search across the wide spectrum of countries? Uh, could you talk about the commonality and maybe 
one of the better phrase best practices or a model that seems to have worked. And what the government's uh, 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 total government structure would that suggest. And the second is to, question is to put the uh, very down is better than um, we use the phrase um, that we must have some of the skin of the game as it were. Um, and that it leads to having the stake in the during it, in parts the necessary incentives to so say working towards the common goal. And I'm going to get into that. Um, so everybody has a stake on the putting in funding, and that's how you get to the best uh, outcomes. Um, could you talk about some experiences and how does it work in, uh, uh, at, at, at the firm level? Because you normally see it more as a, as a policy measure across uh, the, the sectors. And the other question was, we uh, talked about virtual reality as an instrument. And given, for instance, in India, the sheer magnitude uh, of, of the problem, when you're talking about new color workers in particular, um, Talk about how experiences have been in using. Um, that virtual reality, of course, is very expensive, but other forms of digital media. Okay, okay. so what we'll do is we'll have uh, a wrapping up and response to questions. We will start with Professor Kuruvira, uh, two minutes each. Uh, Professor, you go first. So, uh, on the coordination problems issue, so uh, firstly, uh, let me say that. Wherever coordination has been more successful, generally in small countries with homogeneous populations, um, uh, and they are not usually inclusive. And uh, where there is um, a relatively well-educated workforce. So, if you said, where are the examples of Singapore? I know Singapore is not a homogeneous population, but it's a very small country, well-educated workforce. Sweden, Denmark, 5 million, 6 million, 8 million people, uh, Finland, um, Slovenia, these are all countries that are, sort of have reasonably excellent. The smallness is important because the two big players in most countries in the skills development arena is the Ministry of Human Resource Development, or whatever it is called, labor, and the Ministry of Education. And these are the two big, big players. And, and in most countries, in, in small countries, they work together largely because they have some kind of institution that brings them together. Like the Singapore is the Council of Technical and Professional Education. So you have you have to have an institution that brings forward. And all of these small countries have to do it. The second is 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 some kind of you know glue, real glue, something out there that also brings people. So in, in Singapore, that group, that group has been developed right for a long time. It's part of the country's economic development strategy. The fact that everybody understands what is required. The fact that uh, this blue is further intensified by uh, the trend of you know, collaboration across different ministries, job rotation across different ministries. The blue is also uh, acquired through you know the fact that people meet a lot here. Uh, endless meetings. Government Europe at level, right? Everybody knows it. But those meetings accomplish a purpose. They get everybody onto the same page. Uh, so, so these are, you know, as far as I know, these are the only uh, institutional kinds of practices that make for successful coordination. Uh, there are countries like the U.S. where it is completely different. The Ministry of Labor and the Ministry of Education do not even talk, let alone have a meeting. They're completely independent. And so you begin to sort of see that you know, all in China, that's how it all is. So there is some degree of mechanism that uh, requires uh, an institutional mechanism. I think, for example, how do you build in a team lease into the Indian discussion of skills? You know, where it is government and firms. So what about labor market opportunities? Where do they come in? So again, we need an institution. Uh, unless it is completely informal. If everything can be handled by two secretaries in the Ministry of Education and it's this development sector meeting for coffee once a week, so be it, and that's the informal mechanism. So formal and informal mechanisms are crucial. But, and, and, uh, 
when you say the ministry, we're independent. So at the level of cabinet or parliament, etc., there is a joint responsibility. Is there not? Te technically, technically, but practically, they have their own goals. They have their own agenda. They have their own accountability systems. They <coughs> okay, we start. Maybe I first answer the virtual reality question. So the cheapest one that I see is uh, basically using mobile phone manufacturing in India. I think it's seven hundred dollars. They take a video of how they operate the machine and we put that um, phone there. So the three ship actually using the same phone to work. So that is the cheapest one and it's actually um, created by the yeah, shop floor by themselves. Do you want me to answer all three questions? Well, you have your two minutes, you can use them the way you like. <laughs> right. Look, I'll, I'm going to consolidate the, the skin in the game and a few item questions because I think those are, those are two sides of the same coin. And it goes back to, um, and I'm going to link it to the internship program because I think that's a perfect example. For me to take an intern into my company, I have to assign a person to develop a program for them, create training, give them a job, basically, right? So literally, if the University of Singapore comes to me and says, Linda, we want you to hire uh, some interns in your, in your school uh, and give some work experience to our, to our folks, I would say, okay, and I would have to go away and go, well, geez, that's actually a lot of work for me. Because I don't have a job sitting there that's not currently filled. And if I did have a job that wasn't filled, I'd be looking for somebody with a different skill set than these interns, right? Unless that intern has the exact same skill set that perfectly matches to an open job that I have today. Honestly, they're more of a problem than a solution for me. So the first thing is, giving me a free intern is actually creating a lot of work for me as an employer. Why would I be motivated to do it? Because I'm a good corporate citizen. That would be my motivation. But that would be the only motivation. And then I think the challenge is how do you convert somebody who's come to your company on an internship program who really didn't have the right skills, knowledge, or abilities to be successful in the company in the first place, how do you then convert them after a three or six month internship into a permanent job? Because ultimately internships should correlate with jobs. And as an employer, I want an internship all that makes sense for my employee in needs, not, not for the universities. So when you do a force fit on the internship and give me a free resource, fundamentally, that's going to fail probably at all three levels, university, individual, and employer, because it's a lot of work to make that successful. Conversely, we did hire fresh graduates recently in Singapore in intern capacity, and we did actually create a job. And this is a company of 3,000 people distributed globally. We were very late from private, you know, we've got four levels of leadership, and that's it. We had no headcount. We literally created a job for this individual because they were that. <laughs> so if you bring someone in who has the fundamental basic skill sets that the company is looking for, they then have opportunity to be successful. And that in turn creates the success story that you share about at the university that the internship program actually helps. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have had a good discussion on alternative paradigms. I think uh, it was very stimulating, good participation, uh, good points made, of course. Um, uh, let us give the uh, speakers and participants a hand. I think you a great topic. Just one point about this uh, fear of failure in acquisition of skills. I think uh, Professor Saroshi you, you mentioned. Uh, in Hokkien language, I think in Singapore they call it Kiasu and Kiasi, and life has to be a balance, an equilibrium between either fear of failure and the fear of death. We acquire too much, but ought not to acquire so much that you are not able to deliver and you die. So it's, it's that, uh, that intricate balance that we have to achieve. Anyway, uh, I'm afraid you have just 15 or 20 minutes for tea, you'll have to get back at 11.40, so you either have your sandwich or your coffee, uh, one or the other. And come back in time at 11.40? 11 11 Thank you, Dr. Thank you, ladies Sir. and gentlemen. Uh, I would just like to request Dr. Chaudhary to present some tokens of appreciation to the speakers. Okay. Uh, firstly, Professor Kovala. Next, Ms. Betty Lau. And 
Ihnen das in den Nerdarms. Ladies and gentlemen, we shall now adjourn for the tea break in the foyer outside. We request you to be kindly seated by 11.40 a.m. for the next session. Thank you.